Hello everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Daily Grey Refuel, where we recap the latest news in the Ethereum ecosystem. I'm your host, Anthony Sasano, and it's the 19th of September 2022. Alright everyone, let's get into it. So, uh, week after the merge, uh, basically a new week. Uh, you know, I know the price action hasn't been great over the last few days. It's kind of funny watching all the reactions to that, people being like, oh, it was a sell the news event, oh, the merge means nothing, uh, the minor sell pressure was just a meme, it's not ultrasound money, and all just like this, this weird stuff just kind of being posted. And I guess like it's just the state of the market, right? Like we're in a pretty deep bear market just generally. Uh, I don't think, I mean, at least I never expected us to just like pump straight away after the merge, right? Like it just doesn't work like that. Fundamentals don't get priced in over the short term. It's it's normally over the longer term. And I think that you, all of you would be aware of that. So I'm not gonna kind of comment on the price too much there, but I do think that just generally there's so much noise right now, uh, on, on especially on crypto Twitter. That's probably just worth ignoring a lot of it. Maybe just spend some time in the Discord channel, in the Daily Great Discord channel, where there's a lot of nice discussions going on. Uh, or maybe just take a break for a bit. I mean, they're, they're really, at the end of the day, like if you just listen to the refill, you'll probably get like <laughs> most of what's happening in the industry anyway. So you probably can just go in outside and do something different to crypto for a little bit because it's going to be quiet, I think, for a, for a while here. Uh, the demand is basically non existent right now. I mean, on chain demand is very low. Demand for buying assets is also very low. And I think that's just a function of the the way the kind of wider world is right now. People are trying to just get by. Uh, inflation's still still quite high in the macro environment and it, you know it's not great. And the media obviously is, is putting like a lot of fear into people's uh, hearts and minds. But at the same time, out of play uh, out of times like this comes opportunity. So I mean I forged my kind of I guess audience and 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 my positions in the bear market and it ended up really well for me. Not there's no guarantees that it'll end up you know, the same as, as it was for me if you kind of get involved now. But I think that generally, like as long as you're getting involved with things, as long as you're having fun doing things, as long as you're not blowing yourself up, then there's not really anything to worry about. But uh, that's all I'm going to say about, I guess, market related things. Want to get into a bunch of the news from the weekend. So Beacon Chain participation rate is back above 99% again and steadily as well. It's not just a once off thing. It's pretty steady as you can see in my screenshot here. And then also on Beacon Chain, you can see that it's pretty much back to pre-merge levels, which is amazing, right? Absolutely awesome. And I also appended to my tweet here, I said, you know, I'm still in a bit of disbelief over how well the merge actually went. It speaks to the incredible talent we have working on the Ethereum core protocol, feeling more bullish than ever on Ethereum. So... I think people are still underestimating how monumental of a feat the merge actually was. And the fact that it went uh, through so smoothly is just like the cherry on top. Like the merge itself, I mean, we all know, I've talked about it for so long, was a monumentally complex software upgrade at the end of the day, right? And it wasn't just your regular software upgrade. It was one done uh, uh, on a decentralized network that has distributed actors all over the world. There was no top-down kind of, I guess, centralization. There was no CEO telling, uh, telling anyone what to do. There was just a community coming together to build something amazing and to transition to proof of stake from proof of work. And we did it. And we did it with no disruption to users. It's just absolutely incredible, right? But I think because the price went down, most people are just like making fun of it now and just saying, oh, look, the merge was the sell the news event, haha, ha, ultrasound money, blah, 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 all that stuff that I just said before. And I think that's clouding their judgment to the, I guess, like, and clouding their longer term thinking around what that actually means. And to me, what it means is that Ethereum researchers and developers have proven to both the market and just crypto in general that they can ship really complex upgrades with no disruption to users and do it in, I know it, you know, it wasn't done in a quote unquote timely manner. There were, I guess you could call them delays along the way and it took longer than we expected, but it got done. It wasn't something that never happened. It, it did happen and the network has continued running just fine. So that's going to play into all the other upgrades that are coming. Obviously, we have Shanghai that's coming next. It depends, you know, we don't know exactly what's going to be in Shanghai. Hopefully Beacon Chain withdrawals and EIP4844 slash proto dank sharding. But just generally, I don't think there's, a, I don't think Ethereum's execution risk is, uh, is, is very great anymore. I think the merge was obviously the biggest bit of ex execution risk, but the roadmap is clear. Uh, people are energized. People are very confident about what we're building, uh, and it, it seems because of the merge going th through so smoothly, the people in the know, the people that look look past the short-term price action are definitely not underestimating it, but still, I think the wider market definitely is. And 
It's just a function of what people are in this industry for. Uh, obviously, a lot of people are always in this industry to make money and everyone feels better when the price is going up than when it's going down. I mean, even if you're in it for the tech, you obviously still feel better when the price is going up rather than down, right? It's just natural human feeling. I mean, I don't blame anyone for feeling like that. But I think looking past that and looking to the the, the fact that, yeah, it was a monumental achievement is the better use of, of time. So I guess kudos again to everyone who made it happen. Just as I said, still in disbelief over how well it went. I honestly expected five to 10% of the network to fall off at least. We didn't even get that. We got like two or 3%, I think it was. And now we're you know back above 99% uh, and everything's going smoothly. We obviously finalized straight after the merge on that first uh, epoch there. So there wasn't really any issues at all. I mean, I recapped this last week. I'm not going to go into it again now, uh, but uh, I think it shouldn't be underestimated. That's for sure. Uh, and in, in kind of like re related news, I spoke about how the staking APR would go up post-merge. There was a lot of speculation around what this would be um, during the bull market and during the bear market. Now, obviously, because fear of a new was much higher during the bull market and MEV was also much higher, the staking APR was, uh, and, and I guess like the the spreadsheets that were floating around, kind of guesstimating what the APR would be, were much higher than what it ended up being in reality. So I saw estimates of up to 15% APR. Now, if the fear of a new was the same as it was, we would have had that. But obviously, the fear of a new is nowhere near what it was. It's down like 90 plus percent. And so the yield's going to be down. So Buddha here from Beacon Chain put out this uh, this tweet saying the Ethereum network APR for the past 24 hours, which was over the weekend, was 5.8%. So I think from what I've seen, the APR is ranging from about 5.5 to 6% right now, which is still amazing. It's an ETH denominated yield, right? Still amazing. But... I think that it's obviously a far cry from what people felt like they were promised during the bull market. And people did get ahead of themselves quoting those really high numbers. But I think because the high fear revenue, fear revenue went on for so long, it wasn't that wild of an assumption to kind of say that it would continue because it went on since basically... I guess like you could say early to mid 2020 until maybe earlier this year, the, those high gas fees persisted and everyone was just in disbelief about it. But obviously that's come down and now the APR has come down as well because, uh, or it, at least the, the real APR that ended up being is not anywhere near what the, I guess, speculative APR before we merge, which is totally fine. Because as I said, when Fear Revenue kind of picks up again, obviously MEV picks up with it and the APR will go up and then more people will stake. And it's kind of like a balancing act especially when we have withdrawals enabled, you know, maybe 5.5 to 6% isn't enough for people, but they can't withdraw from staking right now. So they'll wait and we'll see. Maybe the, the uh, staked ETH amount will go down and then the APR will go up because of that. But I don't know. I don't really think so. I think a lot of people right now can exit their stake if they want to. For example, if you're staking with Coinbase, you can exit right now, but obviously you take a, a bit of a, a haircut on your staked ETH because of the fact that there's a discount of the CBE token, but you can still exit if you really wanted to. Uh, you can exit out of Lido at any time, obviously, because you have the STETH token, you can exit out of Rocket Pool. Anything that has a, a liquid token, like a staking derivative token, you can exit out of. So anyone who wants to exit staking can do so right now, but you will probably take that that hit depending on what the, I guess, like LSD is trading at on the market. But I think, you know, obviously, Post withdrawals, we're going to see a big reshuffling, a great reshuffling, as I've discussed before. And it's going to be interesting to see where the stake lands. Like, I actually, you know, for all the people who say that stake right now is relatively centralized, I actually think we're in a pretty good position because, like, Lido, which has got the biggest share, 30%. Like I've been through this before. Obviously, it's not ideal, but at least Lido isn't like one monolithic entity, right? It, it, it obviously is that 20, 28 different entities. So at least it's that. Um, and then Coinbase and Kraken and Binance, th their share of the network isn't actually that high, r relatively, right? Um, obviously, we would like better distribution, and I, I would like to see it as well. I would like to see, in my ideal world, I would like to see no one uh, entity controlling more than 10% of the stake on, on Ethereum. And I don't think that's actually a big ask. Some people will say, well, stake is just going to naturally centralize over time. I don't think so. I think we have enough incentives, both technically and socially, to stop stake from centralizing but uh to you know more than 10 percent in one entity but right now it's hard because of the fact that there's no withdrawals it's very hard for anyone to 
like even if they exit their position, uh, it's impossible for that ETH to not be staked with Coinbase or with Lido or with whoever because you can't actually withdraw it from there. All you can do is exit that position, but the ETH is still in the beacon chain, right? It's still staking. So from that perspective, we're just going to have to wait till withdrawals are enabled. We're going to have, we'll obviously keep promoting the competition because at the end of the day, even if like uh, it's centralized entities that have 10% or less, it's still better than one centralized entity having 30%, right? Or 40% of the network. We obviously want to try and keep it as distributed as possible. And also, it's not just stake distribution, it's geog geographic distribution as well. And there was a tweet last week that I don't think I have up right now. Maybe I, 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 you know, I did. I, I talked about it last week. That's why I don't have it up here. But there was that tweet last week about how 90% of operators of Lido actually aren't in the US. And it, this, this obviously doesn't just apply to Lido. It applies to every single staking service provider. The, the more distributed they are geographically, the better. Because if one geogra geographic um, location, such as the US, decides, hey, you know, staking is illegal for some reason, right? They're not obviously not. I don't think they're going to do that. But maybe you know Gary Gensler had made comments about how he thinks staking derivatives are securities well if that happens then these centralized providers can't actually offer staking anymore well wouldn't it be better that it was geographically distributed so it wouldn't disrupt anything on the network and it wouldn't disrupt people I don't think it would disrupt the network because like they would have to just shut down their, down their validators if they didn't want to register for, I guess, like securities trading. And then it would just require them getting out of the network and there'd be a queue and all that. I mean, it'd still be, I guess, like overall a little bit disruptive, but not really. But still, like if they were based in other jurisdictions, then it should, in theory, be fine. So... We definitely need geographic distribution as well as uh, stake distribution there. But uh, I'm going to end uh, that one for there because I've got a bunch of other things I want to get through. Um, yeah, so I guess speaking of staking, I put out a tweet. I just wanted to give people a friendly reminder here. You don't need 32 ETH to run a fully validating Ethereum node. It only requires consumer-grade hardware to run the node software, and you only need 32 ETH to be a solo validator that earns rewards on the network, aka a staker. Now, since the merge, I've seen Bitcoin maximalists absolutely just like imploding, just going crazy. And one of the talking points they keep bringing up is the fact that you can't validate the network anymore. You can't run a full node without 32 ETH, which is completely false. Like you can go run a full Ethereum node right now. You run a consensus layer client, an execution layer client. That is a full Ethereum node with only consumer grade hardware. You do not need any ETH to do that. And someone asked in the comments, you know, are there any incentives to run an Ethereum node? And of course, there's no direct monetary incentives just to run a node, but I said there's a few soft incentives. You can relay your own transactions instead of relying on a third-party RPC such as Infura or Alchemy that could potentially censor you, right? Um, you can verify the state of the chain for yourself. That's what we mean by fully validating Ethereum node. Uh, and you help the decentralization of Ethereum as well by having a copy of the chain on your own hardware. So, uh, there's, it's kind of like difficult, if not impossible, to offer direct monetary incentives to, for running a full node because I guess the people who are rewarded on the network uh, and the proof of work, it's the miners for actually putting in work and and actually validating and securing the chain. And then on proof of stake, obviously the rewards go to stakers because they're putting in the work and they're verifying uh, uh, and, and securing the chain as well. Whereas a, a fully validating node is not doing that. The, the node is really just like monitoring the chain, keep it sync, be, keeping in sync with the chain and letting you view the chain from a, in a fully decentralized way, but you're not doing anything directly to secure it. Like you're not attesting to blocks, you're not proposing blocks or anything like that. You're just keeping a copy of the chain on your own hardware so that you have uh, a way to, I guess, be fully self-sovereign. And running your own node and relaying your own transactions via that node is uh, is extremely powerful, I think, in, in my mind. And, you know, I, it's kind of funny. People often ask me, why should I run a node? Well, these are the, these are the reasons at the end of the day. But I just wanted to quickly debunk that FUD again there. Um, there was a tweet here from Nate, who's, who uh, works in research at Coinmetric, showing you know the moment of the merge going from somewhat random Ethereum block times to predictable 12-second intervals. I think I showed something similar last week, but just another visualization of how under proof-of-work block times are probabilistic, which means they're uh, assumingly random, and under proof-of-stake, it is deterministic, which is predictably 10-second intervals. Now, obviously, this introduces an issue in uh, with regards to MEV, where people can know ahead of time who's going to propose a block, uh, and, and because of that, we have this SSLE thing coming hopefully soon to prevent any gaming around that, any multi-block MEV and stuff like that. But still, it, it's cool that we have 
you know, predictable block times. I think that's very cool for not just regular users, but also things like L2s. They can have better, I guess, estimations around gas fees, better uh, guarantees around inclusion and all that sorts of stuff there. So very, very cool to see that. Uh, Aragon put out a blog post over the weekend. I think they're working on Aragon 2.0. I'm not sure if they actually said Aragon 2.0 in this post, but they definitely are working on a major upgrade uh, to Aragon here. So uh, this is the post-merge release of Aragon, dropping alpha designation and progress of Aragon. Okay, so they did call it Aragon 2. I, I thought I read that somewhere. Uh, yeah, so they are calling it Aragon 2, which I, I think is like a, a big upgrade to the, uh, the existing Aragon client. And now, I know Aragon, is a, it's an execution layer client. They've had a bit of issues uh, over the past few months with, when it came to, I guess, like during testing around the merge and stuff like that. So they're definitely working on fixing a lot of those issues, and it's part of the Aragon 2 effort, which is very very, very cool to see. But you can read this blog post for exactly what they're working on. I'll link it in the YouTube description below. All right, so a few tweets about MEV here. So Tony, who's an Ethereum researcher, uh, shared this updated and beautified charts of MEV boost. Note the MEV boost relay API was used for the data, no data of manifold yet. So you can see some stats around MEV and share of MEV boosted block building. So right now, um, Flashbots is dominating, as you can see in the green on the top chart here. Uh, and there's a few other relayers. Uh, the red one here is blocks routes max profit, which seems to be second uh, coming in second. And and then I think third is tied between like blocks routes regulated one and blocks routes ethical one. Um, but there's no tracking for manifold uh, just yet. And there's a bunch of other stats here as well around average proposer payments, uh, share of total block building and builder gas used. So you can go check that out. I'll link it in the YouTube description for some more stats around MEV. Now, speaking of MEV, there is a dashboards floating around showing like the, the these things that three of, uh, I guess, like, okay, I should take a step back here. There are not only dashboards, but there's this narrative right now that only a select handful of addresses are proposing blocks on, uh, the, um, on the beacon chain. Now, the thing with that is that like anyone using an MEV relayer will be viewed as, I guess, like one address or one entity, when in reality, they're not. Because as Bert says here, the fact that the fee recipient of MEV boost blocks is actually the builder is gonna mess up a lot of dashboards on validators. You'll actually want to look at who the last transaction in the block is paying to figure out who the validator actually is. So on the dashboards, it's going to show you the builder so basically just this one address that is relay uh, that is kind of like um taking in those MEV related transactions on the MEV uh, MEV boost blocks uh, and, and kind of like putting pushing it out there. Uh, whereas the individual validator that is actually uh, kind of producing that block or attesting to that block or, or uh, sorry, no, proposing that block is inside that in, you have to kind of like unpack that to show that. So that's why the dashboards are kind of messing up here. So it's kind of funny just seeing like, people not verifying the data that they're looking at and not actually bringing nuance to the argument, but rather just looking at something and seeing, being like, oh, look, Ethereum is super centralized because of this. It's it's so dumb. Like, it really is just so dumb because, like, when you, like, look, look at mining pools. I mean, I think seven entities on the Bitcoin network control 90% of the hash rate, which means that they produce 90% of the blocks. But no one says, hey, look, Bitcoin is super centralized because 90% of the blocks are produced by seven entities. Because we understand that mining pools are made up of many different miners and miners can switch pools whenever they want. The same is true for... MEV uh, boost relays. It's made up of many individual, uh, many uh, different validators. And on top of that, you can change the relay that you use. So if the relay starts doing dodgy things or starts censoring you or starts doing whatever, you can change to a different relay just like you can change to a different mining pool. It doesn't mean that things are centralized. So I, I wanted to clarify that for people who may have seen that FUD kind of floating around here. Uh, and speaking of, uh, last thing, speaking of MEV, uh, Anisha from... Um, Actually, he's not at Paradigm anymore. I think he's more of a, a solo guy now. But he's built a dashboard to track top relays and builders at mevboost.org. So if you're interested in seeing all, all things MEV on the Beacon Chain, this is the place to be. As you can see right now, only 18.6% of all blocks are built by relays right now. So Flashbots obviously has 81% dominance among that. Uh, but yeah, it's not really that many, uh, that much of the network right now. So I think people are waiting for MEV Boost to be more tested in a Beacon Chain environment and also probably waiting for these relayers to some of these other relayers to come online. I've actually decided against using MEV boost at all, to be honest. Like I know I said previously that I would 
use the non-censoring relayers, but honestly, I'm just not going to use it at all. And I wouldn't say like I have a reason that is like a hard reason. It's more of like a soft reason that I want to build my own blocks. I want to propose my own blocks. I don't want to be going through third parties. I think MEV generally is pretty toxic. I think that we should be doing our best to eliminate as much MEV as possible. And am I leaving money on the table by not running an MEV boost and um, relay? Uh, sorry, MEV boost sidecar to my validators? Oh, sure, I am, right? But to me, it's it's kind of like worth it to uh, keep the network as decentralized as possible. And as time goes on, we're going to eliminate the... I mean, the goal would be to eliminate the need for things like this, for tools like MEV Boost and for, for things like Relayers. So I think that'll get eliminated eventually. But I don't know. I just feel kind of like wrong profiting from it so to speak but i don't blame anyone else for profiting from it or wanting to i mean at the end of the day like this is money that's being left on the table if you don't run these sorts of things but me personally i just don't think i'm going to run it but you can go check out the mev boost website for more data around mev on the beacon chain all right, so I think the layer three term is going to stick because Vitalik posted a blog post over the weekend called what kind of layer threes make sense. I know I've said in the past that the layer three terminology is just going to continue to um, confuse people. I mean, yeah, I guess it will, but like everything confuses people in this industry. So what's another term that, that we can throw into the mix? Um, but uh, this blog post is well worth the read. It talks all about kind of... Um, uh, kind of fractal scaling and things and things that layer threes can be good for. It's really in line with what I guess Starkware has been putting out. So you can see here that I guess like you've got L1 Ethereum, L2, which is like public Starknet, L3, which are these other things built onto the public Starknet, such as app-specific Starknet and StarkX. And then you can even have L4, which is like a privacy Starknet. So it's all about, I guess, like abstracting away uh, uh, infrastructure as high as you can and then just doing specialized things at different layers. So I'm not going to kind of summarize this for you. You can go check this out. I'll link it in the blog post below. But yeah, I think I've lost my silent war on the layer three terminology. I think we're just going to have that floating around from now on, uh, just, especially because Vitalik posted about it. All right, so this is pretty big news. Infura have announced that they're going to launch a decentralized infrastructure network. Now, for those of you who don't know, Infura is an RPC, which is basically a uh, uh, some node infrastructure that relays most of, I think, the Ethereum network's transactions. And the reason it does that is because it is the default RPC on MetaMask for the Ethereum mainnet. Now, Infura has obviously come under scrutiny uh, for a long time because it has been centralized. And because it is centralized, they can potentially censor or control what transactions they relay. Now, I think given that we had the OFAC stuff recently, given that uh, just generally they're aware of the power that they have uh, in, in, you know, not over the network directly, but over anyone who uses them for relaying their transactions, they have announced this, uh, this mission or this plan to decentralize their network. Now, does this mean a token's coming? I think so. I don't think they've announced a token or anything like that, but to build decentralized infrastructure like this, you need some way to incentivize it. And I mean, what way, better way than a token, right? So I, I do expect this to be a new network, uh, like a new infrastructure network, like the graph, for example, uh, or the graph protocol, where there is a token that incentivizes people to run this infrastructure. Honestly, I don't need incentive. I will run this infrastructure for free on my own hardware just to contribute to decentralization of the network. But in saying that, we shouldn't rely on altruism for that sort of stuff. Like not everyone's like me. Most people are not like me. So I do think there's going to be a token coming with this. Now, outside of that, outside of the token, I think this is a really, really good thing that's happening. And I think that Alchemy will probably do something like this eventually as well. Whether, the, like, I don't know, I'm not going to make any comment about the tokens price or anything because I have no idea what it's going to be worth, no idea what it's going to be used for, or anything like that. But if we can actually build successful decentralized RPC networks that are used, I know there are already some out there, but they're barely used. Infura taking away their centralized RPC altogether and pushing everyone onto to their decentralized one is the biggest win we can have on the RPC front, I believe. So I'm very much looking forward to them doing this. I'm not sure if they've given, I don't think they've given any dates or anything, uh, but the fact that they've just kind of like uh, 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 publicly announced this and also they're calling on infrastructure providers to sign up here for early access is really bullish in my eyes. So I'm super excited about this. I think this is the best move they could have made. And as I said, I'm looking forward to being one of those infrastructure providers uh, once this thing is live. All right, so uh, not going to read this out, but Domothy here shared a comment from ETH Finance talking about why ETH behaves much more like a commodity than a security. 
There are so many people out there trying to say that ETH is a security, and it really doesn't make any sense. And this post on Reddit does an extremely good job of describing why it doesn't look like a security and why it looks like a commodity. So go read this. I just wanted to highlight it for you guys. I'll link it in the YouTube description. But the TLDR on this post is that ETH is not a security, whatever the FUD flavor of the day is these days, it, 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 as it does not meet the Howey test that determines what is a security. It also grows, smells, and tastes like corn. I mean, a commodity, so it should be treated like a commodity from a regulatory point of view. Now, you'll know what that TLDR means if you read the whole post. It's not too long, but I'll link it in the YouTube description for you to do so. All right, so another good thread here around how a scroll roll-up works. Now, obviously, you guys have heard of scroll before. I've talked about them. They're building a ZK EVM on top of Ethereum as a layer two. Well, under the hood, there's been a few explanations, a few different threads around this, but this one comes from Chris, who is building the scroll ZK EVM, so he would know a thing or two about this. But you can see here a nice little graphic of how it works and a, and a thread with a bunch of different graphics and an exp explanations on everything that you kind of... um need to need to uh need to to know about it so i'll link this in the youtube description for you to give a read uh but i think you know it's always like especially in times like this where the market's quiet this is the time to be researching stuff like uh, zkvms you know layer twos in general uh privacy all that sorts of stuff because it gives you uh, time to do it. Like there's not any noise right now, really. At the end of the day, the, the noise right now I've noticed is literally just dumb tribal stuff on Twitter. There is no price noise. There's no, there's not even anyone really complaining that the price is going down anymore. Some people will shit post here and there, but everyone's kind of like, whatever, it is what it is. Let's just keep doing what we're doing. And maybe, you know, hopefully the market comes back eventually. That's what 2019 was, uh, which is kind of funny. I mean, it was actually worse in 2019, but as I said, perfect time to learn, educate yourselves about a, a bunch of the various things. So I'll link this in the YouTube description for you to give it a read. All right, so just a quick update here on ENS. So they've gotten a control back on of ETH.link and it's now back online. Their ENS injunction against the domain squatter was successful and the name has been returned to them. Users are welcome to resume using the service or keep using the excellent community run alternative, which is ETH.limo. Now, just a quick recap here. I, for those who don't know, ETH.link expired because it belonged to Virgil Griffith and then the domain squatter bought it up, I think, or got access to it. And then ENS filed an injunction against him to stop him from being able to gain control over it and the domain was handed back to ENS as and they've got control over ETH.link again which is good a good outcome I believe so very cool to see this uh, if you want to keep using ETH.limo feel free to do so but you can now use ETH.link again all right, last up here, we have a uh, something called Starkboard, which is a, uh, I guess, like Starknet data tracking dashboard. So Starkboard V1 is now live. You can go to star app.starkboard.io to have a look at the uh, Starkboard itself and have a look at the Starknet overview. So you can track things like TVL, uh, users, uh, transactions, volume, fees, ecosystem. This is great. Like This is what I've been talking about where we need a fully fledged kind of overview of each of these L2 ecosystems systems, not just TVL, not just users, not trans just transactions, but things like volume and fees and ecosystem. And then you can see validators and bridges and just everything that's happening on the network, I want to see. So very, very cool to see this new Stark board here. What I really liked seeing was this wall, uh, this users thing, because the users are actually growing. Like they've got 147,000 wallets on there now. Now, obviously, uh, wallets don't... Um, map one-to-one -to, -one to users, uh, but you can see a daily active wallets. Uh, it, it peaked during, I guess, like May and June, and there must've been something happening then on, on Starknet. But you know, you can see here the the active users and, and what they were before. Uh, active wallets are all detailed here, transactions, volume, everything. Yeah, so I'll link this in the YouTube description. You can go check it out. But this is what I've been looking for. I want fully fledged, detailed dashboards to track all these sorts of stuff. I don't just want TVL. Like that's just the most naive way of looking at these sorts of things. Uh, and I think that we need better ways and uh, better kind of, uh, I guess like um, data around what's happening on these networks. So very cool to see this. I'll link it in the YouTube description below. But on that note, that's going to be it for today. So thank everyone for listening and watching. Be sure to subscribe to the channel if you haven't yet. Give it a thumbs up, subscribe to the newsletter, join the Discord channel, and I'll catch you all tomorrow. Thanks everyone.